This verse, John 8, 58, presents us a really exciting opportunity to examine the whole question of bias in translation. Bible readers are used to seeing John 8, 58 translated in a very particular way. And so, because of our traditional expectations, we might not even notice that there is bias going on in the background here. And so this will be an exciting opportunity to point that out and to get you to consider what the other possibilities are, because there are really three different ways you can translate this verse, broadly speaking. Here are a few typical translations. The NIV reads, Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. The NLT reads, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. The NAB reads, Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. And the ESV reads, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, there are a couple of unusual things going on here. First of all, the sentence is inverted. We don't say, to the store I will go. That's an inverted sentence. We, you would only say that if you were trying to emphasize that you are the one going to the store. To the store, I will go, right? That's not normally the way we speak. And so it is with this sentence, before Abraham was, I am. It's, it's a strange sentence, right? And then secondly, the translations sometimes will actually capitalize I am. As you can see here in the NLT, at the end of it, I am is all capitalized, and the NAB. Now, the NLT is an evangelical translation, somewhat of a loose translation, and the NAB is a Catholic translation. I mean, these are very different sources of translations, and yet they both make the same move. They both arrange the sentence in the same inverted manner, and yet capitalize I and am in the sentence here. What is going on here? The important phrase in John 8, 58 is really the last two words, ego and me in Greek, which can translate as either I am, I am he, or in some cases, I have been. Christians have long thought that Jesus here is claiming to be the I am from Exodus chapter 3, where Moses is at the burning bush. Let's take a look at that verse now. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 in the NIV reads, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. We can see above, those of you who can read Hebrew, that this phrase, ehiyeh esher ehiyeh, and then ehiyeh here, is what the NIV chose to capitalize. I am who I am, and then I am. Isn't it interesting that the NIV capitalizes the, these words? It's almost like it's anticipating John 8, 58, so that later on it will be able to refer back. However, other translations, like John Golden Gay, who translated the Bible for everyone, he did the Old Testament in that two volume, N.T. Wright did the New Testament, John Golden Gay did the Old Testament, both from an Anglican perspective. John Golden Gay's translation reads, God said to Moshe, that's actually Moses' actual name, I will be what I will be. Interesting. So instead of I am who I am, it's I will be what I will be. He said, say this to the Israelites, I will be sent me to you. Now, anybody who can read Hebrew knows that ehye just means I will be. It's an, imperfect, uh, it's an imperfect tense in Hebrew, which generally maps, at least in classical Hebrew, generally maps to the future tense in English translations. There is a perfectly legitimate way to say uh, I am or I have been in the, in the past, these kinds of things. But this is a future tense, and John Golden Gay very straightforwardly, even though tradition says Ever since, uh, you know, movies and books and old, old English versions, everybody knows it's supposed to say, I am who I am, right? Well, that's just not what it says. I don't know what to tell you. Here's another version here, Robert Alter, his version, and God said to Moses, Robert Alter is uh, Jewish, and he just, he just transliterates it. Look at this, ehiyah, esher, ehiyah. And then he also puts in, I will be who I will be in English right after it. And he said, thus you will say to the Israelites, Ehiyah sent me to you. Okay, so Robert Alter is one example of a Jewish translation. You could look at the Stone edition of the Tanakh. You can look at the uh, Everett Fox translation. And you'll see over and over again that the Jewish translations, the people that are experts at Hebrew, will usually translate this, not as I am, but I will be. Now, of course, all Hebrew letters are capitalized, so 
most of the time we don't capitalize words when we translate to English unless it's a, a proper noun, right, or the beginning of a sentence. But a number of translations want to capitalize all the letters in I am or I will be here because they're used to seeing God's name in all capital letters. But that, just so you understand, that is an editorialization. That's not what the Bible does. That's somebody's trying to bring out some extra sense or meaning here. Furthermore, the Greek translation of Exodus 3.14 is O-On. So the, the Hebrew phrase, Ehiyeh here, which is translated as I will be, comes into the Greek translation done two centuries before Christ as O-On, which means the being or the one who is. I'm saying to you that Exodus 3.14, the translation I am, is extremely questionable in the first place. I mean, maybe, maybe there's a grammatical argument you can make that I'm not aware of, but it seems like that's, it's not a slam dunk. Second of all, if you wanted to signal Exodus 3.14 in John 8.58, you would, you would either translate it as, you would either have Jesus saying, I will be, or uh, the one who is. Because if, if, if you put it in as, I will be, if Jesus says, I will be, then Jesus is claiming that same designation we saw in Exodus 3, 14 from the Hebrew. If he, if he puts it in as the one who is, or he who is, or the being, oon in Greek, then that's clearly signaling the Greek trend. We don't get either one of those. We get ego ami. Let's move on a little bit and look at, first of all, translating ego ami and take a look at a couple of other similar verses because really this is how you figure out translation bias, right? You look at how the same translation translates the same phrase in different places. And if it's wildly different, you gotta ask yourself, well, what, what's going on? It's the same exact phrase. Why would it be translated differently here than there? And sometimes there are grammatical reasons, but other times it's because of theological bias. So John 8, 58, as we already mentioned, the CSB translates it, I am, before Abraham was, I am. New World Translation translates it, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. So that's different. The LB, the Living Bible, translates it, I was in existence before Abraham was ever born. The New American Bible, before Abraham came to be, I am. And the New King James Version, before Abraham was, I am. So this is all a translation of the same exact phrase in Greek, ego me coming in these different ways, either as I am, I have been, I was in existence, I am all capitalized as if it's a divine title, a couple of times. Now let's look at another column here of a different verse in the same chapter. This is verse 28 from chapter 8, uh, where we have the same exact phrase, ego and me, right here, same as phrase that we saw in verse 58, but here the translations get a little different. So the CSB had I am in verse 58, but then I am he in verse 28. It's the same exact phrase. In John 8, 28, the CSB reads, then you will know that I am he. The New World Translation also translates it differently, as does the Living Bible, although the New American Bible is holding on. They're consistent, but the New King James switched. And so, again, my point is not to say that you have to translate every phrase exactly the same throughout the Bible, but if you translate it very differently, I think as the reader, we have to ask the question, is there a legitimate reason for that? Is there a grammatical reason for that? Is there a contextual reason for that? Or is it that you just want it to mean this here, and you're nudging me in a certain theological direction. Let's look at another verse, John chapter 9, verse 9. So in John 8, 58, Jesus is speaking. Jesus says, I am. In John 8, 28, once again, Jesus says, I am. In John 9, 9, now it's the blind man, same exact phrase, ego of me, but how do we translate it? Well, the CSB now softens it even more. I'm the one. So now we get a contraction. So when Jesus says it, it's, I am, insert echo reverberations, but then when the blind man sa says it, it's, I'm the one, I'm the one you're looking for, right? I mean, if you remember John 9, that's really what's going on. It's like, is he really the blind man? He looks like the blind man. Get his parents. Hey, is he the blind? There's all this question about like, are you the right guy? And he's saying, ego of me. And he's not saying I exist. And he's not saying I'm the one who spoke to Moses at the burning bush. He's saying, I'm the guy. 
Um, and that's pretty clear here. The New World Translation, I am he, pretty consistent. The Living Bible, I am the same man. That's interesting, right? The New American Bible, I am. But look, we lost the capitals. So if Jesus says ego in me, it's capitalized and there's a halo around his head. If the blind man says it, it's just lowercase. So when examining this, it's helpful to see how these translations are going to render the same phrase in different places. Um, but we also want to consider two other verses in John that use a similar kind of syntax to show you how this verb to be can work when there is a timing element in the Greek construction. So let's take a look at John 14.9 and John 15.27. Uh, the literal Greek reads, for so much time, with you I am. All right? And look, this is, not, this is not funny or weird. This is just how Greek reads. Oftentimes, from an, our English perspective, Greek reads inverted, in, in inverted sentences. That's just the way it is. The Greeks would probably argue that English is using inverted sentences. But um, translators always switch it around. That's totally standard operating procedure. So like, for example, the NASB, one of the most literal translations ever made in the English language, translates this, have I been so long with you? It literally reads, for so much time with you I am. They made the present tense a perfect tense, and they took that, that ending there, and they put it out front. Why do they do that? Because that's what translators do. They straighten out inverted sentences, and they recognize based on timing signals in the phrase when a present tense should really be translated as a perfect, or just to simplify it, as a past tense. Okay? Now, what's the timing phrase? For so much time. So in this sentence, Jesus is not saying, for so much time, I am existing with you. I mean, technically, I guess. But what he's saying is, I've been with you for such a time, or have I, it's actually an interrogative, a question, have I been with you so long? Let's look at the other example here from John 15, 27. Here we have this phrase, you are. So it's the same word, it's the verb to be, but it's now the second person plural instead of the first person singular. From the beginning, with me, you are. That's a literal word for word translation. However, the NESB renders it, you have been with me, from the beginning. So they took that you are and they put it out front, just like in the last example. And instead of translating it as a present tense, they translate it once again as a perfect tense. You have been. And why do they do that? Because there is this timing element here from the beginning. And so the timing words or phrase indicate to the translator that we, we have a present tense, but it's actually playing a past tense role here. Let's take a look here at a little bit more. Both of these other texts tell us that you can take a present tense and make it into a past tense. We've already seen that standard operating procedure is to straighten out inverted sentences. So what is going on here with these translations? What is going on with this? Before Abraham was, I am the Christian Standard Bible and a great many other Bibles as well. Now look, unless you're Yoda, you can't get away with talking like this. Furthermore, as we can see, the New World Translation here does, and as does the Living Bible, does recognize the timing word before in this phrase. So the phrase is, before Abraham uh, came to be or existed, I am. But because of the word before, they recognize it just like in those two previous examples and the NWT and the LB was like, oh, pss, we know how to do that. We'll do it just like the way we did it in all these other places and we'll move that into a past tense. Now here's what's so interesting about that. The New World Translation is the Jehovah's Witnesses translation and the Living Bible is the, the evangelical scholar Kenneth Taylor's translation on which the NLT, the massively popular New Living Translation, was based. In fact, the earliest version of the NLT, the 1996, kept a translation very similar to the Living Bible and didn't dangle the I am off the end of the sentence and rather rendered it much more similar to I was in existence before Abraham was ever born. Now, these are strange bedfellows, wouldn't you agree? The Jehovah's Witnesses and a darling of evangelical Bible translation? Uh, but they're actually following an established grammatical rule. This is from Herbert Weyer Smythe, Smythe's Rule 1885. 
says the present when accompanied by a definite or indefinite expression of past time, like the word before, is used to express an action begun in the past and continued in the present. The progressive perfect is often used in translation. Then you also have the BDF rule 322 under the perfective present cites examples of present tense verbs with a past tense meaning, including Luke 13, 7, 15, 29, John 15, 27, and John 5, 58. Now here's what's crazy about this. There aren't 58 verses in John chapter 5. I, I'm thinking that this is actually a typo. It's a pretty obvious typo for John 8.58. I think the BDF actually cites John 8.58 in Rule 3.22, where it's giving specific examples of present tense verbs that have a past tense meaning because of the signaling word that preceded it. Jason David Badoon presses the issue a little bit when he writes, why would translators whose job it is to make the Bible into comprehensible, good quality English choose an awkward, ungrammatical reading instead? Why do Bible translators, which in thousands of other verses, freely change word order relative to the original Greek, suddenly find a reason to follow exactly the Greek, producing an ungrammatical and syntactically strained sentence in this instance? He's talking about John 8, 58. He concludes, the answer is theological bias. So let's look at a number of translations that actually do reorder the sentence. We have the Wessex Gospels. This is a super old English translation, which is pretty cool to look up online, from the year 1175. Then we have the Bible by James Moffat in the year 1935, the New Testament in the Language of the People by C.B. Williams in 1937, an American translation by Edgar J. Goodspeed in 1939, the original New Testament by Hugh Schoenfield in 1985, the International English Bible by a committee under Stanley L. Morris in 2014, the footnote in the original New American Standard Bible, 1971, actually says, before Abraham was, I have been. Uh, or I have been since before Abraham was, reordering the sentence. Uh, the Unvarnished New Testament by Andy Gauss and the New Living Translation, 1996. Also, the Living Bible, 1971, and the New World Translation of 1984. So these are not super well-known translations, but they do come from a lot of different sources and so show us that this is a legitimate possibility. But still, there is a third translation possibility for John 8.58 based on previous verses with similar language. And for that, we need to look at John 4, 25 to 26. This is what it says in the NRSV. The woman said to him, this is the woman at the well, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, Ego me, I am, or I am he, the one who is speaking to you. The phrase, I am he, here is ego me, it's the same phrase, and in this verse, it clearly means, I am the Messiah. Furthermore, twice in the same chapter, we encounter ego me, John 8, 24, where Jesus is talking to his opponents, and he says, I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he, ego me. I am he what? Who? The Messiah, the one that God has sent. John 8, 28, so Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that, what, I exist? No, they know He exists. They're talking to Him, right? So what, what is He saying? Is He saying, I am with the echoey voice here? No, I mean, nobody except for the NAB thinks that. Who is Jesus claiming to be? We get the answer for that in John 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in His name. The point of His gospel, this is a purpose statement, John 20, 31, is that reading these words, you would believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. This is the main message in verse 24 of chapter 8, in verse 28 of chapter 8, and it could also very well be the point of verse 58. And this is how a number of other versions translate ego ame. The first one up here is the ED, the emphatic diaglot of Benjamin Wilson in the year 1864. Before Abraham was born, I am he. The REV, the Revised English Version of Spirit and Truth Fellowship International from the year 2014 edition says, before Abraham was born, I am the one. And they italicize the words the one because they've been added in by the translators. The KGV, not KJV, 
But KGV, Kingdom of God version by Ray Faircloth in 2013 says, Before Abraham came into existence, I am the one. The OGFT, or as I like to call it, the OGFOMMT, the One God, the Father, One Man, Messiah translation by Anthony Buzzer of 2014 reads, Before Abraham ever existed, I am the Messiah. So here we're getting even more explicit. In the emphatic dialogue we just had he, in the REV, in the KGV, it's the one. In the OGFT, or OGFOMMT, you get the Messiah. And then, last of all, the MIT, the McDonald Idiomatic Translation of 2008, says, before Abraham appeared on the scene, I am, and then in parentheses, it says, the one anticipated. So, we do have a number of these other translations that are saying, look, Jesus is not claiming to pre-exist Abraham here. What he's claiming is that he is the Messiah planned or anticipated before Abraham was ever born. We know that the Messiah and God's salvation plan was in, is, was in place since at least Genesis 3.15, where we get the first promise about the gospel. So my goal here is not to take a side on this interpretational issue. That's, that's not what I'm doing here. That would take a lot more time. My, my goal here is merely to show you the possibilities. Here are the possibilities for John 8.58. Number one, before Abraham was... I am, I'm emphasizing that, but that's like the capital letters, right? I am. Jesus was claiming to be the I am from Exodus 3.14, or some people will argue that Jesus is claiming to be the I am or I am he from Isaiah 41, 43, 46, 48, and 51, those various chapters. This is, this is somewhat problematic, as I mentioned already. Exodus 3 just simply does not say I am. And if John 8.58 is trying to refer to Exodus 3.14, it's failing. It's just not making the parallel. In English, it shines. Oh, it's goodness. Beautiful. I, capital A-M, I, capital A-M. You see it all day. But in the Greek, it doesn't shine through. In the Hebrew, it doesn't shine through. So I think that's a really strained interpretation. To say that the Isaiah texts are trying to link in to John 8.58, I think is also strained because the, and we don't really have time to go into this in too much depth, but the Hebrew for the, these Isaiah texts is anihu. Ani is the word for I, who is the word for he, and that's how you say I am he in Hebrew. You just skip out the verb am. So it actually says I he, <laughs> which means I am he. And uh, if you read those Isaiah verses, it's all about God saying that I am I am, your, I am your God, I am the true God, I am the first and the last, I am the only God, this sort of thing, over against the gods of the nations, over against the gods of the Philistines or the gods of the Ammonites or these other nations or the Babylonians and so on, the Assyrians. You know, Jesus, or, uh, God, what God is saying here in Isaiah is, I am He, the one true God. Now, is that what Jesus is saying in John 8, 58? I think you'd have to read that in. The, dis the dispute there is about whether or not Abraham saw Jesus' day. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about whether or not Jesus is Abraham's God. You read the chapter yourself. I don't want to um, tip the scales too much on your interpretation here, but I, I do want to say that this first option seems to me, based on the grammar, based on the context of the chapter, to be the most strained, even though it is the most exact translation of the Greek. In other words, it's following the Greek very carefully, word for word, but what I'm saying is that it's also the most strained interpretation based on these other grammatical factors that I already discussed. Ironically, the versions who insist on the ultra-literal word order for John 8.58 translate the identical construction differently in other places, as I've shown you. Thus, option one is actually, my estimation, the least attractive on grammatical and theological grounds. Options two and three are much more likely. Here's option two. I have been since before Abraham was. So that would be Jesus claiming to have pre-existed Abraham either physically or in God's plan. That's simply what he's saying. He's like, look, I have been since before Abraham was, whether that is physical or notional pre-existence, Jesus is claiming a, pr a priority in time to Abraham. And then option number three here, 
is before Abraham was, I am he. Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah, literally existing or existing in God's plan before Abraham existed. We have three different possibilities for how to translate John 8, 58. But the, the problem is when our translations squeeze us into just one way of thinking, then they don't even give us a footnote to say, hey, well, you could read it this way or this way. There is, there's none of that. It's like, no, this is what it means. This is the way we've always read it, and that's it. I'm sorry, but that's just not going to do in our modern time where we have access to standard grammatical dictionaries and other translations that, you know, sometimes they, maybe, they, maybe they're wrong, maybe they're right, but at least they don't have the same bias. They're giving us a different perspective so we can study the issue through on our own. Um, and really, that's, that's the goal here is to interact with the text of Scripture and to see what the different options are and then to weigh those options. And that's the whole point of Bible study and interpretation. All right, we've gone on uh, long enough on this one on the uh, different options for John 8, 58. This is now our fourth out of five different examples of bias in translation where I'm trying to show you very commonly understood renderings. They're actually not slam dunks that could go different ways depending on the beliefs of the translators. So next time we're actually going to get into the whole subject of the Holy Spirit and translating the Holy Spirit and there are some unique grammatical challenges there. And that will be our last one of this series in bias in translation. And then we'll have one more episode where I can offer some concluding remarks. And uh, that will be the end of our series together. And so I look forward to doing that with you next time, looking at the Holy Spirit as we continue our quest to understand how we got the Bible.